still hadn't seen the painting for himself.
is ordered to forfeit $86 million. He has since been released and hopes to return to the art world. You can find all the latest books at the bottom of the BBC Sounds homepage. Just scroll down and click on audiobooks. In a few minutes, we're discussing nature writing after we spend some time in the great outdoors ourselves. A new series of ramblings with me, Claire Baldwin. I think this is my favourite bit. It is very pretty here. Ramblings is such a simple idea. Just go for a walk and talk to people. Hello, hello. The best Ramblings companions have planned the route. They can talk, they have a story, they have a bit of knowledge of the area. The Bluebell spectacle up on Ivy Knolls is just really, really amazing. And they're just fun to be with. <laughs> when you see a dog running like that, you get a sense of what unfettered joy is. I love it. A new series of ramblings on Radio 4 and BBC Sounds starts next Thursday afternoon at 3. BBC News at midday. The Prime Minister has warned Conservatives considering voting for a reform in the UK that they risk handing Labour a blank cheque for the general election. Summit in Italy was responding to a poll suggesting that reform has overtaken the Tories. YouGov said its figures were well within the margin of error. Other polling experts said Conservatives remain second to Labour. The leader of Reform UK, Nigel Farage, said he wanted to become the country's opposition voice. Back in 2015, when I led UKIP into a general election, we got four million votes and one seat. But we're looking this time at many, many more votes than four million. We're hoping to get through the electoral threshold. Whatever we do, you know, we may not get the number of seats we deserve. But are we going to win seats in Parliament? Yes. How many? There's three weeks to go. The Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Norman Trott, said YouGov's findings underline what was at stake. This candidate is a soft I'm not going to play it. If a result like this is replicated at election day, here's the answer to levy exactly the type of taxes that we're talking about today. On your home, your car, your job, your business. President Putin has called the G7's decision to use £40 billion in frozen Russian assets to help Ukraine fight the war theft. He said the move agreed at the summit yesterday would not go unpunished. The court in China has sentenced a prominent women's rights activist to five years in prison for subversion. Sophia Huang Shuqin was a leading voice in the country's Me Too movement. As a journalist, she wrote about sexual abuse and gender discrimination when few others would. Another campaigner, Wang Jianping, was jailed for three and a half years. Asia Pacific editor Celia Hatton has been following the case. Sophia Huang and Wang Jianping, her friend, would gather in Mr. Wang's apartment. They would gather friends together and they'd all talk about issues like gender discrimination or Mr. Wang was a labor activist. And that's really, I think, what threatened the authorities. The fact that all these young, very well-educated people were getting together and they were talking about issues. And that's what the Chinese government really doesn't like when they're outside groups talking about issues that the government feels that it should be dealing with. An agreement has reportedly been reached for the African National Congress to lead a unity government in South Africa. The ANC lost its majority for the first time since 1994 in elections last month. The new government is expected to include the ANC's largest rival, the Democratic Alliance. The chief executive of Tesco, Ken Murphy, says the retailer is seeing a gentle improvement in customer confidence. Tesco's latest quarterly figures show a 3.4% increase year-on-year -year in total retail sales. More than 100 comedians have met the Pope at the Vatican. Attendees at the event included Whoopi Goldberg and Stephen Merchant. The Pope said, at a time of many social and personal emergencies, comedians have the power to spread serenity and smiles. He also stressed the importance of having a sense of humor. This, I will say now, is not heresy. When you manage to make intelligent smiles gush from the lips of even one spectator, you make even God smile. The manager of the Scotland football team, Steve Clark, says his players respect everyone and fear no one. They did the start of Euro 2024 tonight. The tournament kicks off with Scotland playing the host Germany in Munich. The city's tourist board estimates that about 150,000 Scotland fans are visiting for the match. The former Scotland midfielder, Graham Soonis, says a good start is imperative. 
the way I see this first game, what's really important for Scotland, obviously, to get a result would be you know, a great start for them, but not to get beat up, because then they it would affect their confidence going forward, and the two next games basically become games you have to win. BBC News. This is BBC Radio 4. Our drama this afternoon is a dark medical thriller. Brother and sister navigate a web of secrets and a mysterious illness in an isolated village as the specialist continues here at a quarter past two. But now on Radio 4, Rare Earth. This week, Tom Heap and Helen Chersky present a special programme from the Hay Festival. Hello and welcome to Rare Earth on Radio 4 and BBC Sounds. This is the programme which explores the big questions about the environment and the natural world. Today we are looking at nature writing. What's it for? Who does it influence? And can it save the planet? Uh, lofty aims indeed. And to pose these questions, we've left the studio and decamped to the Hay Festival in Hay on Y, where we're recording this episode in front of a live audience in the BBC Ten. <laughs> I'm Tom Heap. I've been a, a broadcaster and journalist in this space for a, at least 25 years. I work on Radio 4, uh, Country File on the BBC, and also uh, written a couple of books. Uh, I'm Dr. Helen Cheresky. I'm uh, an academic, I'm a physicist and oceanographer, and I'm interested in how the world works and how we look at the world. So as well as researching it, I'm interested in sharing all the amazing perspectives on the world, because I think that's a very important part of the future. Well, Helen, let's just kick this off by saying, what was it perhaps in the, in the nature book sphere that first kind of captured your attention? Well, so this was an interesting one to think about, and we will come on to this later, because what counts as a nature book? And the, the first one I could actually remember picking up and thinking of it as a nature book, and this is a kind of scientist cheat, sorry about this, it's by a guy called T.J. TJ Van Andel, who's a scientist, and it was called New Views on an Old Planet, and it was basically the story of Earth. And um, I remember reading it because I remember him lecturing me at university and being really excited that this was the guy who'd written that book and I got him to sign a copy. Um, but the other book that really is probably, probably more classic nature writing, writing is Desert Solitaire by Edwin Abbey, which is just this amazing picture of the American desert. And every time after that, when I went to, if, you know, if I had to go to California or somewhere, I would fly over the desert going, why? Why is anyone trying to live here when there's no water? You know, it really made me think about water. Uh, how about you? What are your nature books? Well, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an apology. I do feel a bit of a fraud in this environment. If my family were here, they would be screaming at me, he never read books as a child, he doesn't know anything about literature. And it is kind of a fair criticism that probably my background is more about listening and talking rather than reading or writing. Uh, but I am going to go way back actually for uh, a nature book that influenced me, and that was actually a children's book called A Time of Wonder by Robert McCloskey, which was uh, set uh, in, in a sort of an American lakes area, and it was about um, a storm that came in and the mixture of the nature and the people that lived there. But I absolutely loved this book as a child. There was a lot about the power of nature. I don't want to get too confident, but there was a lot about the interaction between humanity and nature, and maybe that's kind of led me uh, a bit to where I am today. And one of my, my other ones is a total prick if I had to read it for A level, <laughs> and that was A Mill on the Floss by George Owen, where of course, once again, you know, Nate, the power of nature flooding makes a, a, a very, very big impact. And probably uh, since uh, then, or up until recently, it's been a bit on the expeditionary side. Touching the Void by Joe Simpson. Um, the Conquest of Everest, interesting use of the word, by uh, James, then Jan Morris, which is an incredibly powerful and very humane book, actually, despite the fact that it's about this kind of heroic expedition. So I think those are probably my springboards. But isn't that interesting? Because I think as adults, certainly I, I tend to read books once. Whereas when you're a kid, you know, you have a kid's mm. book and you just keep reading it. And, and especially if you're reading for A-level, you probably definitely keep <laughs> reading it. It sinks in in a different way, I think. Maybe people in the audience here at Hay do read books multiple times. But that kind of really makes an impression when you get them early on. And I can imagine, we'll come on to this, but I can imagine that might be particularly true of nature books, because you want to go back to dwell in that space and, and, and feel what it was like to be there. Well, joining us to talk about all things nature writing here on stage, we have a fabulous panel who are all passionate advocates for this genre. Um, to my right, we have Mark Cocker, who's a multi award winning author and naturalist who writes regularly for national newspapers and magazines. And his books include Bird Britannica and Our Place. And 
One Midsummer's Day, which tells the story of Swifts, and that was published last year. So, Mark, just to start with you, what are you, what are you reading at the moment? Um, well, I'm reading a work of philosophy which is 1,800 pages long by a guy called Ian McGilchrist, but I've also read his previous book called The Master and His Emissary, which is probably the most important book on the environment that I've ever read. But in terms of conventional nature writing, I'm looking at Kapka Kasabova's Anima, uh, which is coming out next month, and Kapka wrote a great book called um, Elixir last year, which was fantastic. Joining us also is a uh, presenter and author, Philippa Forrester, originally on Children's TV. She's since presented to Tomorrow's World, Robot Wars. I have to say, respect. I've got, <laughs> I've got three boys. That was a big deal in our household. I think you've got three boys yeah. as well. Anyway, moving on from Robot Wars, um, the, the Heaven and Earth show, and of course, much more recently, Philip has written about her experiences of living beside the River Avon and has shared her fascination for wolves in her book, based on time in the States, in her book, On the Trail of Wolves, her most recent book, Wild Woman shares the stories of female conservation heroes. So, same question really. What's on your bedside table nature-wise currently? Not nature-wise oh, okay. <laughs> uh, at all currently, which made me laugh because I thought, oh, I'm going to have a proper look. What's on there? No nature books at all. <laughs> In fact, Kathy Lett is on there because I went to see her at another literary festival last week. So it's all non-nature right now on my bedside table, I have to confess. And do you have any favorite nature books or? Are you... Absolutely. So then I went and looked on the bookshelves and it's stacked. And it really gives you a view on yourself when you look at your own book collection. And so much is nature related right the way back. And it was really interesting to hear you talk about children's books because I think that's where it starts. All of my children's books, I've still got most of them, and I find it really hard to get rid of books. But they're nearly all animal related or landscape related in some way, and then you think, oh, there are the seeds planted, and then you see them grow. Keeping books is great, isn't it? Because it's kind of like seeing your own history on your yeah, bookshelf. Right. Anyway, um, and our third panellist here in the tent at Hay is botanist Chris Thorogood, who is Deputy Director and Head of Science at the Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum. And Chris specialises in parasitic and carnivorous plants, so be very nice to him. Uh, he's a regular <laughs> on Gardener's Question Time on Radio 4, and his books include Weird Plants and The Pathless Forest, The Quest to Save the World's Largest Flower. And he was showing us some pictures just before, and it is quite an impressive flower. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, what are you reading just now? Like Philippa, I, I sort of looked at my bedside stack of books, and a lot of them honestly are fiction. So, like all of us, you know, I read lots of things, not just nature writing. Um, so, a sort of miscellany of different things, to be honest. But one of the things that I love to do as a reader is sort of dip in and out of things. So, I'm not very good at starting and finishing a book, uh, quite honestly. So, I often sort of um, dip in and out. And I did, for the show, find a lovely thing that I'd like to read out, which is... Brought your notes and everything. I know, I, know I can't remember it off my heart. Um, so this is a couple of sentences from the greatest master of haiku poetry in Japan. Um, and this is what he wrote in the 1600s. He's called Matsuo Basho. And this was his work called Narrow Road to the Interior and Other Writings. And he wrote, Months and days are the wayfarers of a hundred generations. The years, too, are goings and comings of wanderers. I, drawn by a cloud wisp wind, have been unable to stop thoughts of rambling. And I just thought that was so poetic and beautiful, and it's the sort of thing that if you're looking for inspiration as a nature writer, you can just sort of dip in and out of something like that. That certainly gives you a bit of a feel of the history of nature writing, and yeah, people were there for many, many hundreds of years for us, and they did, I'm sure, back to the Greeks. Anyway, let's have a warm round of applause for our three wonderful panellists. Just, you know, some context here on nature writing, that this is really an increasingly lucrative market. I mean, it's brilliant to be here at a book festival where everybody cares about lucrative. books. Well, <laughs> it's probably lucrative for somebody. There are some big numbers. How well it's shared out is possibly a different question. Um, but according to Nielsen Books, who provide sales data on publishing, £18 million was spent on books categorised as natural history in 2023, which is more than double 10 years ago. And of course, we can have a debate that what counts as natural history. You know, there's a broad church there, and sometimes it includes gardening, not that there's anything wrong with that, Chris, but some people would include that and some people wouldn't. You know, you can have travel writing and fiction, all kinds of things. But either way, the point is that 
there is increasing interest in this. It seems that something is changing here. Tom, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, do you see reasons for this? Can you interpret this? Well, I, I did wonder if it was a, a form of escapism. If you like it, science fiction for townies. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's being able to get yourself into a different world. And there's nothing wrong with it at all. You know, that's what we do in fiction a lot. You know, I love movies. That's what we uh, do in movies a lot. That, that's absolutely great. But I, I did wonder if it's more driven by a need to escape from reality rather than engage with some aspects of reality, something we can pick up with our panel later. But I did wonder if there was something in that. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about how it grew in the pandemic. So there also might be something about, which kind of slightly contradicts what I last said, but if you're getting to see more places, you want to know more about them. And that increases your your sensitivity to them, it increases your understanding of them. The more you know about them, the more you can see divergence and difference and distinction and stories. It's like I can't see any difference in classical music because I know nothing about it. It also all sounds the same. It all sounds the same. Whereas there's some other Some people in the audience just cringe. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure they did. That happens frequently when I get on stage. Um, but um, whereas there are other things, you know, when you know a great detail, you get so much more out of it. Yeah, you know, rich dynamics. But I wonder if there's another side to it, which is perhaps that people are less familiar with nature. I mean, the number of people, the proportion of the population that live on, in cities is going up. And so perhaps when nature isn't something you see every day, it becomes something to find out about. Whereas when you just walked, you know, you walked to school, you passed the hedge, you saw the squirrels and the butterflies, you didn't think of it as a thing. It was just part of your world. And, and perhaps people are trying to substitute it somewhere. It's not there in the real world. Can I just challenge that? Because our cities are becoming much more biodiverse than our landscape. Our, our countryside, our arable landscape is drenched in poisons which have killed by and large vast swathes until they are monocultures. So our cities are actually often much more complex and work has been done in Germany where German cities are much more biodiverse and people see much more biodiversity in urban areas. So that, that's not strictly true that the countryside and the and the towns are, are separated by a kind of wall. They merge and, but, and interpenetrate. But what they are separated by, and a lot of nature writing does tend to ignore people, and you can do that much more easily in nature in the countryside than you can do in nature in the towns, because by definition it's got to work around people. Yes, yeah, yeah. But as we say, you know, nature writing does include people in it. It's not as if people are absent. It's, it's a narrative that, that mediates the relationship between people and uh, and the living planet. Do you think, um, we might pick this up the panel later, but do you think climate, concern about climate, climate fear or indeed nature, loss fear, plays into the popularity? Of that? I think it probably plays into the idea there's something to talk about, but I also think that's kind of a, a double-edged sword because you also don't necessarily want guilt associated with it, but you, perhaps you do want to understand things in order to do things better. So I think that one probably plays both ways. So. We talked a bit earlier about how it's quite difficult to define nature writing. Helen mentioned it uh, when it comes to looking at the market. Uh, Helen, you've got mm -hmm. some books there that illustrate this quite nicely. Yeah, I had great fun going back through my bookshelves list. But I think, and I mentioned the opinion of the panel on this, that I think. I'm curious about whether our definition of nature writing needs to expand a little bit. And so I've got a couple of books, I'm just going to read from one of them now. So this uh, this is The Worst Journey in the World by Jeremy Anthony Gerald, which is one of the best books about Antarctica ever written. It's a classic, I highly encourage you to read it. But for those who are not familiar with it, um, you know, this is one of the guys who voyaged with uh, Shackleton and Scott, and he's on one of these expeditions, he writes about it. It was the worst journey in the world. There's this bit of it where they go off uh, looking for penguin eggs and they have this horrendous journey to get to where the penguins are about. And I just want to read a bit of it. Where he, so he's describing all of this and he says, I am not going to pretend that this was anything but a ghastly journey, made bearable and even pleasant to look back upon by the qualities of my two companions who have gone. And he says, those who write of polar expeditions, write as though it was as easy as possible. You know, the public will say, what a fine fellow this is. We know what horrors he's endured, yet see how little he makes of all his hardships. And the point he's making and the descriptions in this book make it very clear is that if you're in Antarctica in winter, it's grim. It is not a place for humans. It's horrible. And I wonder whether, the, you know, 
nature writing, sometimes very good nature writing, makes nature feel very approachable and very friendly. And of course, in a lot of contexts, that's very important. But is it not important to also recognise that um, nature can some, kill you? Nature can kill you. You know, we need to have some respect for it as well. That it's not automatically our friend. And I don't know what you think about this. I mean, Chris, there's a lot of poisonous plants out there. Do we sometimes need a bit of to know when to distance ourselves from nature and not just to plunge straight into it? Yeah, I was. I, do you know, I was thinking, Helen, as you were reading that of a, a trip that I went on into a very remote rainforest in the north of Luzon in the Philippines. Um, and I stayed with an indigenous community there and they very kindly took me into the, their forest. And in some respects, I found this a bewildering experience and a beautiful one to see so much biodiversity. We found a new species within 15 minutes, which we're currently describing. So, you know, it's, it, it was a, an incredibly diverse place. You know, I was like a kid in a sweet shop as a botanist, as you can imagine in that environment. But at the same time, it was also damn hard <laughs> and, and actually quite tormenting in, in, in a way. I found it really difficult. You know, I was sort of um, leech stricken and <laughs> sort of scratched and bruised. Um, and actually, I, I became a bit unwell after that trip when I came home. And I remember lying in bed and all I could see were sort of tree branches closing in on me with a high fever for several days afterwards. So, so yes, I think nature can be inhospitable. And I think it wouldn't be truthful for me to sit here and say that nature is always kind and, and friendly and, and there is a darker side to nature you know you think about pollination we usually think about sort of bees and flowers but we have fly pollinator flowers that smell of rotting meat so there is a darker side to it but i think that's also captivating and i think that has a place in nature writing well talking about places that are inhospitable you've got another quote from somewhere oh, yeah. that we really can't live <laughs> well so the other question i've got about what what is included in nature writing is whether you know now humans are starting to go into space and we're starting to look back at the planet earth so traditional nature writing kind of came from you know as we heard explorers and adventures and all of that going to remote places and the explorers of today are you know in space looking back at earth and you get a perspective that you you couldn't see so the other book that i've brought is um, michael collins carrying the fire which just is the best book written about space by anyone who's been in space i highly recommend it so michael collins is the one who there were three of them that went on the apollo mission to the moon Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong got to go on though, and he was the one that was left orbiting around the outside of the moon. There's this bit where he's writing here about so they're flying over the moon and planet Earth is about to come into view and he can see the moon, this grey pitted moon down beneath him. And he says, I'm wrenched back into reality by the sudden appearance of the Earth, a truly dramatic moment or two that we all scramble to record with our cameras. It pokes its little blue bonnet up over the craggy rim and then, not having been shot at, surges over the horizon with a rush of unexpected colour and motion. It's a welcome sight for several reasons. It's intrin intrinsically beautiful. It contrasts sharply with the smallpox below and its home and voice for us. <laughs> and so... Smallpox was his description of the moon. In the moon, the, the pockmarked, pity, you know, pitted moon. But I'm also curious, you know, what are people's opinions on whether we need to include writing from space in nature writing and perhaps the view back? Is that something we should include or is that too far away? Philippa Forrester. Sometimes you feel like you're writing from space just by writing from a place that might be inhospitable or it's because of a disconnection. Yeah. So very often the natural world, as you said, is is not a comfortable place to be. I mean, even lying in a beautiful meadow of buttercups, which you could do not far from here, you know, you're going to get scratched and bitten a bit by ants, and it's not that comfy. Let's face it. You know, certainly not the wilds of Wyoming where I was, or the Amazon where everything is wanting to eat you. Nature isn't a hospitable place. And I would imagine that that feeling is really similar to sometimes that feeling that you get of isolation and of a view back to civilization. It kind of uh, brings us on to our next thing. We're going to talk a little bit about can or should nature writing help save the planet. The other thing I like about the expert excerpt you read is that it's like a literary version of the famous picture, you know, the pale blue dot on the earth that did spur a sort of a feeling of concern for this say, pale blue dot all alone in the universe where life exists and only there so far as we know. I'll start with you with this, Chris. Do you think uh, nature writing should or does have a role in actually fighting the good fight and helping to preserve it? 
Yeah, I absolutely do. And I think Philippa gave a nod to this already. In terms of inspiring people and fostering a greater care and attention for, for the natural world, nature writing is very powerful at, at doing that. So, um, so I'm a, a plant biologist um, and I have a bit of a, a tough time sometimes engaging people with the plant world because generally we're you know we're more attuned to the animals in our environment we are animals and we evolved to hunt other animals and flee them and plants often have a tough time surfacing we see them as the sort of the green backdrop against which we play out our lives this sort of screen of or furniture really if you like um, and I know this um, at the Botanic Garden in Oxford where I work if I show someone a Venus flytrap you know with the jaws that close in on unsuspecting insect prey and often someone will say to me, oh look it's it's alive and I think gosh so we've got to stage when we don't even think of plants as living um, and so I, I know I've got a, a lot of work to do to engage people to see plants because they don't move on on our time frame I think nature writing is a wonderful creative way that we can actually help bring plants up through the margins of the page if you can be creative with your writing and to inspire people with plants help them to see plants in a different way and chris you had this phrase i think you mentioned before as a uh, plant blindness was yeah. it tell us what that is yeah so plant blindness is is a phrase that social scientists have, have coined not everyone likes the term but to describe that very phenomenon that we as animals are better attuned to seeing other animals and, and not to seeing plants in, in the natural landscape and you can actually actually show someone a picture of animals and plants and you say to someone, right, tell us what you see in, in, in this picture and they'll say, oh I see this, that and the other animal and they say, what else, anything else? And they'll peer at it and say, no, no, nothing. <laughs> and you say, no, come on, there's something else in there. Dirt, <laughs> sky, but you know, it's really difficult for people to, to sometimes, not always, but to see those plants and that's human nature. But we do need to have a greater care and attention for, for plants specifically is, is what I'm interested in because actually plants hold many of the answers to the big uh, challenges that we face in society, whether that's around food security or, or carbon capture. And so we can't neglect plants, we neglect them as our peril. And I do think um, nature writing has a place in inspiring people and, and fostering that care and attention of all of the natural world. Trees, I think people are attentive to trees. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But we attune to them in a really different way. I, yeah. I know um, quite a lot of photographers and editors, and there's a phrase that goes around the editors, which is stick a heartbeat in it. If, it, if a picture isn't working, make sure you stuck a heartbeat in it. Even if it's an antelope, which is a dot yeah. on that far mountain, if you stick a heartbeat in it, suddenly it works because we, there's something in us that responds to that. Mark, I just wanted to, to dig in a little bit to this examples of nature writing really helping to save the world or helping to fight the fight. It seems to me that an absolute classic this has got to be Rachel Carson's Silent Spring back in the 60s, similar sort of time that people were going to space. You know, that that is widely considered to have, yeah. you know, one of the wellsprings of the environmental movement, really. Tom, can I ask you if you've ever read it? Uh, you can, and the answer is I haven't read it all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the interesting thing is one of the problems, one of the things that we're constantly eliding is the definition but Rachel Carson's book is probably the central work to, to launch environmentalism in a conscious way. And I think we should is, probably remind people, you know, that the silent spring referred to there was the, the death of insect yes, life and things around yeah, farms, wasn't it, yes. because of the use of agrochemicals? Yes, it was, was, yeah. And of course, she was an astonishing nature writer. Her books on the sea are really amazing. And I haven't read them, but I, I have read a biography of them. And they sound wonderful, but I have read Silent Spring. Um, it's a pretty hard science book. There's some really hard facts in it, but it is it is a classic example of of how nature writing, if we call it nature writing, can really change the world. You know, W. H. Jordan said poetry changes nothing. Shelley said poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, and I think nature writing <laughs> sits between those two, two parameters. It either changes nothing or we're the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Well, can I add to that Joseph Campbell, who said people don't remember facts, but they remember how you how they made yeah. you feel. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I think yeah. nature writing sits. Yeah. We, can, we can write a list of facts and publish it as a book, but who remembers it? We can make someone feel something, yeah. and then you remember. <laughs> Let's come back to this, this sort of tension that Tom's alluded to before between escapism and the call to action, that you can 
read about nature and, and in order to disappear into it, kind of for your own benefit, really, in a sense that you need what nature can give you, and so you read books so that you, you know, you sort of absorb that richness and, and you feel better. And and perhaps before Silent Spring, that that was the only option, perhaps. And then with Silent Spring and the books that the many books that have followed, nature writing books are often quite a call to action. Can you imagine anyone writing a book about bees now without having at least the final chapter on all the terrible things that are happening to the bees and please can we not do this anymore? So where, where does this tension sit and do we risk alienating people because they go, oh, well, if I pick up a book on bees, I just want to know about the bees. I don't want the guilt and the, to feel bad about it at the end. Do we risk turning people off nature writing yeah. if they're all a call to action? That's a really difficult one. Yeah, but I, I think it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. And I, in terms of escapism and a call to action, it, it could actually be both, I think. Um, so, for example, in something I wrote recently, I, I touched upon deforestation, and I decided to approach that very much from the point of view of me as a human being and my experience feeling it. So just as you were saying there, Philippa, about the emotions that that brings to the fore, I think sometimes statistics can turn people off as well. I think they're useful to quantify things, but depending on the context, I wanted to engage people at a more emotional level, so that's what I did. But I think you can also be hopeful, and writing can be a way to, to bring people into the conversation in that way. So for example, there's a, a geographer, Yadvin Damali in, in Oxford, who I know. He and his team work on rainforests in Southeast Asia where I work, um, and he was telling me that secondary forests, which are those that have been in some way degraded or cut down, but have, have then grown back, can actually contain a level of biodiversity um, that might be comparable to a virgin rainforest. And for me, that's a, that's a really interesting phenomenon, because at a time when we're often sort of thinking of giving up hope, and also at a time when we push nature so much to one side and said, right, there's a nature reserve, that's there for enjoyment or amenity or, or, or recreation or whatever. Actually, perhaps we need to reimagine our whole being and relationship with nature and how we coexist and flourish together. Because if secondary forests are actually more biodiverse than we perhaps thought, that's a really hopeful yeah. thing. I just thought of an example of something that I think is both escapism and turned out to be a call for arms. And this is the, the now, well then, very famous book, A Waterlogged by Roger Deakin. And it is one of the ones I've actually read. And um, it, it inspired me a lot to think about um, wild swimming. And look where we've got to now with wild swimming. You can't move any body of water for wild swimmers trying to move away the turds. Yeah. But, but, I mean, I actually was talking to someone about this, and they really think it is you know, a lot of the pressures we have now to create bathing spaces, clean water, inland in the UK can be traced back to, to Waterlog and Deakin. I don't know which the, the, the panel thing Yeah, yeah. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Our, our sense of grief and our sense of loss for anybody who experiences the natural world are, are implicit and sort of inescapable. So, you know, it's a bit like wildlife television where you watch it for 50 minutes and you love seeing all the elephants. And then at the last part, they say, yes, and there are now only 50,000 left. And at the beginning of the 20th century, there were 3 million and we're losing them. And so it, it becomes formulaic and, and problematic, but nonetheless, is it a dereliction of duty to not say that we're down to the last 50,000 elephants or whatever it is. Yeah, because it's part of the story. It part doesn't story. need to be formulaic, though, no. and that's going to be yeah. problematic if, to if that carries on. But it's part of the story. You can't mention bees without mentioning how important they are, but you equally can't mention many things about the natural world without mentioning resilience. You know, my book about wolves is a great example of also how much we don't know. You can't look at the Yellowstone story. We've had 25 years, nearly 30 years since reintroduction now. And what we have discovered is this massive positive effect that putting a top predator back into the ecosystem has on the rest of the ecosystem. We didn't know that before. Conservation, nature, and our knowledge about it is evolving all the time. Our definition of conservation, rewilding is now a thing, you know, that wasn't a thing before. You know, we've changed our definition of conservation from parameters and fences around a protected area to actually, we need to back off and see what happens. And that's now what we're looking at, that's rewilding. But the predator 
I think the other position back in play, but sorry, the, you know, sorry, the ungulate position back in play. We, if, <laughs> let's see what happens. That is the most hay thing ever. Let's get the ungulate position back in play. <laughs> Dear to you. Dear, and I, I yes. Yeah. I, I think I think one thing to say is that if nature writing becomes a self-referential world in itself, a bit like television, where you you simply immerse yourselves in these fantastic images and